Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Daniel Roth, and in this session, we're going to talk about the future of Blazor on the client. Blazor is a client web UI framework based on .NET and C Sharp instead of JavaScript. Now, previously, the browser was a black box that you couldn't get your .NET code into. Now, with Blazor, you can use .NET for your client web development needs. But what if you need to take your app to other native platforms like mobile, desktop, and other devices? It could be really expensive to have to build native experiences for all those platforms. And you might not have the developer resources or the developer skill sets. One common strategy is to use the ubiquity of the web and your existing web developers to build apps with native-like capabilities. In the future, we want to evolve Blazor uh, so that you can use it to build apps that have those na native-like capabilities. So we're going to walk this spectrum from the web to native applications. Now, we've already seen Blazor server apps in .NET Core 3.0. It's available this week. Download it, install it, try it out. Blazor server apps um, enable you to get, add rich client-side interactivity to your existing .NET web applications. Now, they run on the server, but they allow you to have that client interactive feel like a single page web application. They also enable you to leverage the capabilities of the browser using JavaScript interop. Let me hop over here to Visual Studio. Here's the Blazor weather application that we saw earlier this week. This is a Blazor server app. I've already uh, refactored it again to move all of its components into this Razor class library, this Blazor web, uh, weather .core. If We expand some of these folders, we'll see all the, the Razor files in there. There they are. That's so that I can reuse these components uh, in, the, in future demos. On the Blazor server app, we've, we've seen what this looks like. It has a UI for showing the current weather. And one of the things that we already saw is that uh, we do have client-side interactivity. We can click on the and change the current temperature unit. We can also use the capabilities of the browser to get the user's current location by clicking here. That should use the geolocation APIs to give us where we're currently at. All right. Uh, one other thing that I've added to this application that also leverages an additional an additional <laughs> capability is the browser's local storage. Um, I used, uh, it's actually a community project. Uh, was it github.com blazard? This is a project by Chris Sainty, and he's done a whole bunch of really good stuff. He has a package that uses JavaScript interop to enable local storage in Blazor applications. I use that so that if we go back to the app, uh, we can store our pinned locations uh, locally in the browser. So let's like uh, go to Chicago and we'll pin that one. There it is. And now we can cycle through our pinned locations. It, so we have Seattle and Chicago. If I grab this URL, I'm just going to close that tab and then we'll open up a new one, browse back. We still have Seattle and Chicago as our pinned locations using the browser's local storage to store those things. So we get to leverage browser capabilities as well with our Blazor server applications. Mr. Roth, Mr. Roth. Oh my goodness. I what, brought you what, Blazor. What, what are you doing? <laughs> I brought you your Blazor. Oh my goodness. Yes. 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 Got to look the part. Oh yeah. This, the blazing blazer. this makes me ready now for the demo. Thank go. you, Mr. Now Fritz. You All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to blaze on now. OK. Woo! Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not expecting that. OK, so what's the next step on uh, adding more uh, native like capabilities to our Blazor application? Well, the next step is Blazor WebAssembly. Blazor WebAssembly apps uh, run in the browser on a WebAssembly based .NET runtime. Um, Sorry. <laughs> so with a Blazor WebAssembly app, the files can, uh, your app is just a bunch of static files, and they can be downloaded. They, they are downloaded into the browser and then executed. And they can then leverage uh, the capabilities of the browser as well. So I've taken the same application. This is the, the server version. Let's close that. 
let's now go to a different project. And this is a WebAssembly version of the same project. It's actually using exactly the same components. Uh, this is kind of cool. Uh, a lot of uh, customers that I talk to are starting out with Blazor Server uh, uh, with the uh, plan to when once Blazor WebAssembly is available in May of next year, uh, that they can then shift their app to actually run full on in the, in the client. But let's go ahead and run the WebAssembly version of this app. Looks pretty much the same, does the same things. Like we can get the uh, uh, get our current location here. We should, should be in Redmond. Yep, there we are. All right, and then if we F12 and look at what was downloaded to this uh, application, it looks a little bit different. Yeah, so there you see down at the bottom, there's that mono.wasm file. That is our WebAssembly-based .NET runtime. So this app is actually running uh, client-side directly in the browser. Now, um, to show that that's really occurring, we can even debug. Uh, when I F12 again, if we look in the console, you can see there's a debugging hotkey gesture that we can do. Uh, I'm not debugging this in Visual Studio. I'm actually going to use the browser dev tools to debug it. Uh, we don't support debugging in Visual Studio yet for Blazor WebAssembly apps, uh, but we will in the future. For now, don't run it with debugger in Visual Studio, and then you can do, use, do this trick. So I'm going to hit Shift-Alt-D. And that's going to try and uh, bring up the browser dev tools to connect to the tab that I want to debug through a debugging proxy that we set up for you. Now, for that to work, we actually have to run the browser with remote debugging enabled, which I don't have it doing currently. And it's telling me how I can uh, restart it, so it does do that. So I'm going to close down the browser completely, and I'm going to run the command that it just told me to do to restart the browser. Uh, with remote debugging enabled, and we'll hit that gesture again, Shift-Alt-D, and now I should get the browser dev tools that can connect to my tab. There we go. All right, so let's put this uh, side by side with the tab I want to debug. And we've already got some files open. Let's go ahead and close those. In the, in the Sources tab, we can see down here, or we can actually uh, take a look at all of our, let me give myself a little more space, all of the files that are in our application. So there's Blazor Weather Core. Uh, what do we want to look at? Let's look at, let's look at the temperature unit picker. We'll open that file up. We can set a breakpoint right here on the click handler when the uh, temperature is changed. Let's uh, go ahead and get the current location back up on the screen so we can change the, uh, the, the temperature unit. We'll click, and there, we just hit a breakpoint in C Sharp in the browser uh, running on top of a WebAssembly-based .NET runtime. We can even expand down here and take a look at some of the local fields in our, our component. Uh, so currently, the temperature was, was Fahrenheit. Let's hop out of here and let the, let the app continue. If we clip the temperature unit um, picker again, it should say that it's changed and has it. Yep, yeah, looks like we're good. So now the temperature is Celsius. So there, we just debugged our Blazor WebAssembly app uh, directly client-side. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we'll go ahead and let that run. All right. So that's Blazor WebAssembly. Now, we can uh, use some of the more modern web standards in our Blazor WebAssembly app uh, to make it even more native-like. And apps like this are typically called progressive web apps, or PWAs. What is a, a PWA? Well, a PWA is just a web app, but it uses modern web standards to enable things like offline support. You add a service worker so that the files can be cached and used even when the browser is not connected. Uh, support for push notifications. Uh, PWAs tend to, uh, are fast and responsive, so they have that native app-like feel. On some platforms, they can even be OS installable, like you can pin them uh, to your uh, home screen on your phone. Or on Windows 10, you can install them so that it can be, they can be run from your start menu. So we can take our Blazor WebAssembly app and turn it into a PWA. All right, let's do that. So actually, we've already got it running. And if you, we look at the top with our Blazor WebAssembly app, you can see there's a couple of icons up there. And this one here says, install, bl well, install Blazor Weather as uh, a, P a PWA. That's because um, the browser and Windows 10 is detecting that this is a progressive web app. If I go ahead and click that, yeah, let's go ahead and install. And now we see our Blazor WebAssembly app, but it's in like a, a native shell with all the same functionality still works, like, uh, I don't know, St. Louis. We can find new locations. We can uh, get the location by, by geolocation. And we can see that on the start screen of my Windows 10 box, there is my Blazor weather app. And it has a nice little icon uh, so that shows up in the, the start menu. So that's pretty cool. So that's, that's a Blazor PWA. How did we enable this? If we go back to the code, 
and look at how this was implemented. Uh, in the www root folder, we can see there's a service worker that was added to this application. This is a piece of JavaScript that enables uh, caching. And then there's also this manifest file, which specifies like icons that can be used uh, when this app is either pinned to a home screen or, uh, uh, or to the, the start menu on a, on a Windows device. So that is a Blazor PWA. It's starting to look a little bit more native. It's got a native shell. It's, it's runnable from the start menu. Let's go ahead and close that. Great. Hybrid apps are native apps that run natively on the device. They have access to all the native capabilities of the, of the device, but they use web technologies for rendering their UI. So for example, you might have a mobile application uh, that's running natively, but it's using a web view for rendering all of its user interface. Or you can have an Electron application, and an Electron application is using an embedded Chromium shell to handle all of its, uh, its user interface. Uh, uh, let's see if we can build Blazor hybrid apps uh, as well. We've been doing some experiments in this space. Let me go back to, to Visual Studio. All right, so here in my third project, we have a Blazor Weather Electron app. So I'm going to set this as the startup project, and we're going to go ahead and run it. Again, it's using the same components as before. But now, instead of running as a web application, this Blazor Electron app is going to run in an Electron shell. It's a native shell, like we have all the access to all the native uh, capabilities of Electron. The same functionality still works. Uh, let's see what the weather's like in New York. And it goes. We can get the, uh, the current location and so forth. Uh, we have all of our pin sites. And this app is interesting because it's not actually using WebAssembly. The Blazor WebAssembly app and the Progressive Web app, those were both WebAssembly based. They were running in a, inside the browser using the uh, WebAssembly based runtime. And as a result, they were also limited by the browser security sandbox. Uh, a lot of people ask me about Blazor WebAssembly apps when they see DLLs being downloaded into the browser and ask, is that is that safe? Is that OK? Like, is, is there any security issue there? And the answer is no, because the code that's being executed is being executed using that .NET WebAssembly runtime running in the browser security sandbox. So it can't do anything more than what normal JavaScript could do in a uh, browser uh, application. Can't do anything more, and it can't do anything less either. It has all the capabilities of uh, what JavaScript can do, uh, but no more. So it is safe. Um, in this case, though, we're running on Electron. In an Electron app, the .NET code is running in a normal .NET Core process. And that .NET Core process does actually have uh, full access to the native capabilities of the machine. So if you want to touch the file system or open arbitrary network connections with this application, that's stuff that you can do in this application. So basically what we have here is a you know, native desktop app with the UI built using web technologies uh, built using .NET, and it's cross-platform. This will run on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So that's an example of a, what a Blazor hybrid app might look like, at least for desktop scenarios. This is something that we're exploring and investigating. If you want to play around with Blazor Electron, uh, I think I have this URL set up, you should go to hbs colon whack whack uh, Blazor Electron, aka MS Blazor Electron is the URL. And let's see if this is now live. I think I set this up this morning. Yeah, there we go. This will take you to our ASP Labs repo, and we have uh, an experimental project that we're working on that integrates Blazor with, with Electron, and there's a sample there that you can try out. All right. Now, the last stop on our spectrum from web to native is going, uh, well, first we'll get past the hybrid screen, is going full native. Um, actually having a native app, but instead of using web UI uh, web, or web technologies to render the, the UI, well, we use native controls so that we uh, can le leverage the native controls of the device. Um, this is an area also that we're investigating and experimenting with. I don't have a live demo for, for, for this area. Um, but Blazor was architected from the beginning so that its renderer was extensible. The default renderer in Blazor renders HTML, and that's why you use Blazor to build web applications. Not too surprising there. But the renderer can be replaced. In fact, you can replace it with a different renderer that renders to whatever you want, like you might render instead uh, to native controls. 
Um, there's a really cool demo uh, that uh, is just a, a, a tech demo, an experiment. It's not anything that uh, we have any plans to ship, but that Steve Sanderson did at NDC Oslo uh, earlier this year. And what he did is he took the Blazor renderer, he replaced it with a renderer that could render to native Flutter controls. Uh, so he was able to build a Flutter app uh, using Blazor, uh, writing his code in C Sharp. Normally, Flutter apps would be written with Dart. Uh, you, it's a pretty, pretty cool demo. You can take a look at it uh, at the link below, aka.ms uh, Blutter. So Blazor plus Flutter it gets you Blutter, I guess, uh, where you can see Steve Sander uh, Sanderson uh, uh, demo that, that capability of Blazor. Now, again, this is not something that we actually plan to ship, but it just shows you what is possible with the, the, the Blazor uh, model. This is very um, similar in nature to what uh, you, you, you typically write with applications that are using technologies like Xamarin or React Native. These are applications that run natively on the device and then also uh, are rendered to native controls in a, in a cross-platform way. Uh, we're looking at could, could we do something similar with Blazor, like have a, a Blazor native that does a, a very uh, similar thing. Uh, nothing to share yet there, but it is an area that, that we are currently looking at. All right, so this is what the roadmap now looks like uh, for, for Blazor. Uh, Blazor Server is available today. It is supported in .NET Core 3.0. If you want to build a Blazor Server app and deploy it into produ production, you can do that right now. Go ahead and download it, install it. It's great. Uh, you can start adding some uh, uh, rich interactivity to your existing .NET web applications. Blazor WebAssembly, we announced earlier this week, will ship uh, next year. We're targeting uh, May of next year. Uh, we'll start to see more progress on that in the, in the months ahead. Uh, we're also starting work on Blazor hybrid apps and Blazor progressive web apps. Uh, you should expect to start to see uh, previews of that functionality in some of the uh, .NET 5 previews that will be coming up shortly. Uh, .NET 5 is expected uh, to ship in November of, of next year, but hopefully we'll have previews of PWA, PWA support and Electron sooner than that. If you want to play around with Blazor WebAssembly apps uh, as PWAs, there are actually some really nice community projects out there that you can download and install, and uh, those, are, those are really great to, to, to try out. Uh, Blazor Native is not something that we have any concrete roadmap for, but it's an area that we are experiment experimenting with and we hope to learn more about and talk to, talk to folks like you uh, to see what we should, should, should do there. <clears throat> so that is the future of Blazor on the client. I hope you enjoyed the things that you see, that you saw. I hope you're excited about them. Uh, give them a try. Try out Blazor and Electron with a sample. Try out Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, give us feedback. And of course, make sure you uh, download .NET Core 3.0 today. Uh, there is no time like the present, so make sure you're using the, the bits that are already ready available. This is a bunch of useful resources that you can go look at to, to get started with Blazor. Uh, uh, get, go to blazor.net to, to get the bits and find the documentation. Uh, you can get uh, the .NET Core 3.0 bits at the dot, dot, .NET uh, slash get dash core 3. Uh, go make sure you get Visual Studio. If you're on, uh, on Windows, you're going to want to get uh, the latest release of Visual Studio 16.3. Uh, we have a wonderful Blazor workshop if you want to learn how to, to program with Blazor and uh, participate in the Blazor community. They have a lot of great folks like Chris Sainty who uh, did the Blazor project and, and others that are building wonderful uh, JavaScript interop libraries and component libraries. And with that, I'm going to turn the remainder of the time over to questions. Yeah, thank you. Daniel. Check this out. Like, I am, yeah, I am that's sparkling. Pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much. We have um, a little special surprise. What? Another <laughs> <A> surprise. <little> <laughs> what Lots is of this? Surprises go on, just today. go on over there. Just walk over and let's get you. What is this? Let's Scott? get this over there right <laughs> so, now. So I want everybody that's watching to know that uh, this is actually Dan's 15 year anniversary at Microsoft. It what? is. Yes. And um, Blazor probably wouldn't exist without Dan. And so, <laughs> with a lot of people. So with a lot of people work on Blazor. Piece of the Blazor thing. <laughs> and so I want to give you this gift. This is a Blazor pillow. Uh, <laughs> but what's even better about this Blazor pillow is you swipe up. Oh no. my goodness. But there is Dan Roar <laughs> on the Blazor pillow. That Look at that. Is that spectacular is or what? Spectacular. Are that these being fabricated? Awesome. At large, because I'd love to just like <laughs> lay my sweet oh, head on that. Oh, this looks like a one out of a kind thing. I don't know. This, 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 that is. 
Thank Congratulations you, on Thank 15 you very years, much. Dan. Thank it's you very much. It's been a much. good 15 years. To so the next 15 years. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Can, I, can I borrow that pillow for a couple of weeks? I mean, just, just maybe... No. <laughs> Creepy. No. Yeah, <laughs> this got awkward real quick. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, we probably have a ton of questions. Let's do oh, it. wow. Let's, Lots let's of people tweeted you in your over. brand new jacket. So that's pretty <laughs> sweet. Uh, do you want to take a yeah, look? Yeah, let's do it. So let's start from the left here, and we're going to get this question here. Will Blazor be a good choice for enterprise level web apps that need high availability, scalability, and fine grained services on the cloud? Wow, this is really good. Yeah, you know, I, I, yes, I mean, that's what the, it's built for. And Blazor Server in particular, that's what's shipping today, that's what's supported. Um, absolutely supported for large enterprise applications. Uh, like, I think we, we think of Blazor as being particularly well suited to enterprise apps for line of business applications. Um, yeah, it would be absolutely yes, it is ready. So, yes, the answer yes, is and yes, yes. yes. <laughs> All right, uh, what else do we have here? Um, so, what about this one? How do users, uh, how do, um, users update new build versions in a Blazor PWA? Oh, updates, how do you do that? These updates to new versions in a, in a PWA. So I believe yeah. that's all managed by your service worker policy. Like the, so I think the, the inherent question is there is when you download a PWA, you can often set up a service worker so that it's available offline, which is effectively like caches the files. Um, when you set up the service worker, I believe that's where you put policy about like when does the app um, go back to get the new files. And you know, I'm sure there's also a way where you can just force the app to, to, to refresh. Um, but I think that's how you would do it. I'll, I'll have to, I'll double check on that, but that's my, my current understanding. We haven't done a lot of investigations in Blazor and PWA yet. We've just done some early, you know, proof of concepts like you saw today. Uh, this is an area that I expect that you'll see us looking more into in the .NET 5 wave. All right, next question. Any updates about supporting gRPC web for Blazor? Also, Blazor native on mobile. Yeah, gRPC web, that's, that's, that's really interesting. So uh, we support gRPC now in .NET Core 3.0. Um, however, it doesn't work from a browser. You can't speak the gRPC protocol from the browser to, to your uh, front end servers. Uh, there is a variant of gRPC that you can use called gRPC web. Uh, we don't currently support it today, and we don't have concrete plans to support it yet, uh, but we are talking about it as a potential area to, to invest. Um, so don't know yet, but uh, let us know if you think that would be interesting and useful. For Blazor Native, well, we just talked a whole bunch about what we're thinking for, for Blazor Native. Um, we are right now in the prototyping and investigating stage. Um, Blazor was architected from the beginning to support uh, non-web native scenarios where you replace its renderer with some other renderer that can go to native controls. It's very similar to what like uh, React did. React started out as a web framework and then moved to support native apps with React Native. Um, Blazor can absolutely do the, the, the same thing. What the roadmap for that is yet, we don't know. It's still TBD. TBD, OK. Uh, we have another question here. A PWA using Blazor, that's something really attractive. But for now, my question is, which server auth integration is preferred, like Windows or DB? Chrome has problems with Windows auth. Ooh. So which auth mechanism should you use with a Blazor application? Um, so that will, in part, depend on your hosting model, like if you're hosted on the server or if you're running uh, on WebAssembly in the client. Uh, and really, the type of auth you then use will depend on your app and will on, depend on your environment. Uh, if you're running uh, in the client on WebAssembly, that's like a SPA. So you use SPA-style authentication patterns. Typically, that means using like an um, uh, uh, OpenID Connect uh, OAuth-like flows where you acquire a JWT token and use that with all of your HTTP uh, client requests. You can also use cookie-based auth from, uh, from a SPA that is, that is possible. Um, Blazor server apps, you have the whole set of auth options available to you based on what you're trying to do. If you're, if you're writing a line of business application and you have Windows users and you want to let them log in, Windows auth that would be a great option. If you're writing an app where you need users to be able to register their own user pro profiles and have their own passwords that you want to manage, then using ASP.NET Core Identity for your authentication support is a great option. For the WebAssembly apps, using Identity Server support for OpenID Connect would prob be probably what you want to do. Fantastic. So just a couple of pictures. Like this one to me is oh, one. It feels like I'm there. Almost, yeah. Right? I mean, do you feels know like what I mean? It feels like we're, there, like, it's like we're there. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's wild. And another one, of course, wow, Jeremy. Wow, looking sharp. If you follow him, you'll find he did another picture of me, but not as flattering as this one, <laughs> Jeremy. You got to get my good side, buddy. Now the official for more, blazer jacket. For more important <laughs> questions, obviously, can this be integrated with an existing .NET framework project? If so, how? Via NuGet? 
That's that's the you know that's a that's a great question. Could you use Blazor with a .NET Framework app? I mean, Blazor Server obviously not because Blazor Server is 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 running on ASP.NET Core. Like it's using so the SignalR support in ASP.NET Core. So no, with with .NET Core 3.0 you can't run that on a .NET Framework app. Uh, Blazor WebAssembly is just static files, so it doesn't really care what is on the the, the server. It could be actually PHP or whatever on the server. Uh, so technically, I guess you could use uh, .NET Framework on the server with a Blazor WebAssembly app, but it's really been optimized and integrated with .NET Core. So like the full stack experience that we imagine for Blazor WebAssembly is you have .NET Core on the server, Blazor WebAssembly on the client, and we provide you all the nice integration points there. That's, that's we mo how we mostly imagine it being used, but technically, it should be doable. And here's like a super awesome question. Mika, what does it say? Yeah. Um, is that Blazor's future of web development? Is Blazor the future of web <laughs> is development? Is it the future of web development? Oh, no, I'm not trying to put it on your spot because yeah. you're wearing the jacket and you have a pillow with your face on it. Right, Blazor. So whatever you say is super authoritative uh. when it comes to the future of web development. It absolutely is. For, <laughs> for many, many web developers, is it going to be the only way that people write web apps going forward? Like some, some people ask, like, does this mean I, that no one will ever write JavaScript again? Like, no, that's not what Blazor is going to do. There will be lots of people still writing JavaScript. There'll be lots of people writing in all sorts of different technologies. What WebAssembly did is it actually opened up the door for really any platform you want to be used in the browser. So I imagine there'll be people using Python and uh, Go and Rust in the browser as well, but we are working really hard to make sure we have a great .NET full stack uh, web development story. All right, so here's another one. And this is interesting to me because I remember when this was introduced, I saw Sanderson demo it to me. It was me, it was Damian Edwards and Fowler. And we just sat there, we're like, holy cow, this is ridiculous. And the first thing I thought was, perf. Is this, is this going to be the same as the other? So any stats that show performance comparison between ASP.NET and MVC Web and Blazor? Yeah, so, so there's a couple different comparisons that you could do there. First of all, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. And the reason is, uh, like I, I, uh, we talked about yesterday, Blazor is for your client web development needs. It doesn't replace MVC. It, do, it, it doesn't even do the same things that MVC and Razor pages do. Those are server rendered technologies that you use on the server. Blazor is meant to be used in the browser for a client web UI. So you don't even do that. When you, when you want to do a server rendering, you do that with MVC. You don't do that with Blazor at all. Um, but there is some interesting perf uh, characteristics of Blazor that are worth mentioning. Uh, the, um, Blazor is based on a diffing algorithm where you render your components, it calculates a diff, and then applies it to the DOM. That diffing algorithm has been highly optimized to be very, very efficient. When you run it on WebAssembly, there are some known performance issues with any CPU intensive loads on our existing WebAssembly runtime right now. And that's because right now our .NET WebAssembly runtime is doing IL interpretation. And it doesn't have a jitter, uh, it's just interpreting the IL on, on, on the fly. And that can be slower. Uh, we're working on that. We're working on supporting ahead of time comp uh, compilation to WebAssembly, which does give you back that like native-like performance. Uh, we haven't ha had a preview of that yet, but we hope to have one as, uh, as soon as we can, as, uh, shortly. Um, so that will hopefully address the performance problems of running uh, Blazor WebAssembly in the browser. When you're running on the server, uh, you're running on .NET Core. It's super fast, no performance problems at all. All right. I think we have one more question. Yeah, we have time for one more, right? Yeah, we do. All right. Uh, will Blazor support a per razor component server side web assembly configuration in one spa? Ooh. I don't know if I could parse that. Will Blazor oh, yeah. support a per, per razor, razor component server side slash? There's like so many pieces here. That's why it's such a good question. Uh, I think I, I, the way I choose to interpret this question. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, you can well, you are that. wearing the jacket, uh, so, so you can do whatever yeah, you want. I much. think what this is asking is you could imagine maybe having a mixture of hosting models in the same app where uh, this component is going to run on WebAssembly, but that component's going to run on the server. Maybe for whatever reason it makes sense to, to, to do that. We don't have a first class way of doing that today. Um, it is something that people have asked us about. Right now, you either you pick one or the other. You're doing Blazor WebAssembly or you're doing Blazor Server. It doesn't seem like there should be anything blocking it, though, because 
Like I said, Blazor WebAssembly is just a bunch of static files. You could have a Blazor server app. You throw a bunch of Blazor WebAssembly files into its www root folder, and you can download those and use those. So it seems like you could get it to work. I haven't actually done it yet, though, and it's not wow. an area we've really played around with. Uh, maybe that's something that we'll, we'll look at going, going forward. Well, this has been amazing. We have coming up a short commercial break, and afterwards,